Welcome back to another episode of Esports Mavericks and Beyond. I'm doing great today, Sage, and I'm excited because today we're going to be interviewing Christopher Turner, founder and coach at Southern University Esports. Welcome to the show. Welcome, guys. Thanks for having me. I've saw the show before. You do an excellent job. Thank you. We're really excited for today's episode. I really like your jacket, too. Thank you, man. Uh, my wife bought this as a gift for Christmas. So this is actually my Christmas outfit I have on. Oh, it is? Since this is a show for gamers, we'd like to play a little game before we dive in. All right, for a bit of fun? Yeah, for sure. Let's do it. All right. It's game time. Christopher, what game are you most excited about that's releasing later this year? You know, culturally, you know, as, as African-American gamers, I think we all we all look towards a force to 2K or Madden. So I'm excited to what, what the 2K franchise is going to do later on this year. Okay. Do you have 2K23? I do. Yeah, 90, 97 overall, glass cleaner, you know, center. So, yeah, I, I play it quite often. Man. Okay. Do I have a favorite esports team, Mr. Turner? Esports team professional? Yes. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of like lifestyle brands, and I think FaZe has did an excellent job as far as lifestyle is concerned. So as far as having great players and and signing great people, they also have clothing, they also uh do streaming and all aspects of gaming. So I, I would go FaZe. It's a good choice. FaZe does have a cool logo. If you yeah. had to choose one food to eat for the rest of your life, what food would it be? Uh, category or just food? Just one. one. Just, just one food. Oh, I'm a, I'm a South Louisiana guy, so it had to be in that seafood category. Uh, man, that's a hard one, guys. Uh, let's 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 go with catfish. Catfish. Yep. Well, that's your favorite type of seafood. Mm. I I would say I would say yes and no. Um, I'm in a unique situation being in South Louisiana, and we're right next to the Gulf of Mexico. So we have unbelievable fresh seafood and unbelievable types of seasoning because of all the mixed coffee. Oh, that makes sense. I really like flounder myself. Sage likes it too, but catfish is pretty good as well. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for playing. You, you just earned yourself 500 points. I think he deserves more this time. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> For people who don't know who you are, can you share a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. So I've been in education for the last 10 years, K-12 education, uh, that, that kind of merged me over to higher ed. Um, but originally from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, born and, born and raised, I teach on the landmass of uh, Southern University. Southern University is the only... HBCU, Historical Black College in America that has a system. A lot of people ask me, what does that mean? Well, on the Baton Rouge landmass, we have a K-12 school. We have the undergraduate, which is the flagship. We have Southern University Law Center. We have Southern University Ag Center. We also have Southern University New Orleans, uh, which is a four-year institution under the system. And then we have Southern University Shreveport, which is in North Louisiana, which is our two-year university and, and the law center just expanded to Shreveport as well. Mm. And so through, through, through some of those institutions within the system, um, I merged with eSports at the K-12 school maybe four years ago. Uh, then we launched the undergraduate uh, program, which is a student club that I advise. And now I'm uh, at Southern University Law Center where I'm the coordinator of the Mixed Reality Virtual Innovation Gaming and Esports Institute, where we serve underrepresented communities and introduce them to those tracks, those college pathways, whether it be law, whether it be mixed reality, whether it be esports and gaming, uh, through entrepreneurship, course, coursework, and research. Okay. What's the most heartwarming part about teaching? Since it seems like you've been doing it for a long time now, you must really enjoy it. 
No, I really enjoy touching guys, you know, your guys' age and, and, and a little younger and a little older. I, I like the process of being a part of somebody's life and try to expand and try to expose them. Uh, I'm a firm believer in exposure leads to expansion. And so I really love that aspect of teaching, whether it be in the classroom, outside of the classroom, whether it be in the esports lab, uh, just touching, touching you. Um, and not only teaching, learning as well. You know, I, I learn every day from my students. And so, you know, just that, just that, that transparency and, and being able to, you learn, learn from each other is awesome to me. Okay. Okay. So Mr. Turner, I've heard that you're trying to change the way that educators view esports and get esports in more schools. Have you planned on doing it? So, you know, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, you know, through through the Law Center's initiative, uh, we plan on busing kids in uh, to the campus. We plan on doing uh, learn, you know, lunch and learns, professional development, uh, anything that we can do to expand our community uh, to to you know what esports is and what gaming is. You know, I think a lot of people don't know, don't realize esports is just a percentage of the gaming industry. The, the, the gaming industry is a three hundred and fifty billion dollar industry. And so when you look at esports, esports is only, you know, 3.5 billion. And so uh, I think the gaming industry is looking at esports as a way to get more people involved. Uh, we really want to change the narrative because right now African Americans only represent 2% of the gaming industry. And you know, how how do we change that? How do we how do we do coursework? How do we make opportunities for people of color to get into the space? And I think. Southern University historically is one of the best, you know, HBCUs out here that we can kind of gravitate to and bring industry to us and build from there. Um, you know, I, I was just quoting another article this weekend, you know, sky's the limit. And I truly believe that. And so we definitely want to be innovative. We definitely want to have opportunities for us and change the narrative because I think for, for, for us as African-Americans, we consume games, but we're not behind the screen. We don't realize what the opportunities are in those STEM college and career pathways, guys. Well, you're on a pretty good mission, but how do you inter integrate esports into education? That seems like a hard thing to do. I was blessed to be in a great opportunity. You know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in, you know, your steps are ordered. Um, I was, I was, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you this quick story. So when I got to, to Southern University Laboratory School, which is our K through 12 school, you know, um, my background is visual art and graphic design. And so I teach, I teach that course every day. Uh, but when I got my director uh, to the side and realized that he was an avid gamer, I kind of took him on a trip to Dallas and introduced him to the, the esports arena in, in Arlington, which is the biggest esports arena in the country. And we went to a K-12 conference. And so I was fortunate enough to kind of have a director that was an avid gamer that really didn't understand esports, but was intrigued enough to take a trip to learn about it. And I, I know a lot of educators are, are not in that same predicament. And so I know it's a learning curve. Uh, but you know, once you have your 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 director or your principal involved on that level it makes it a little easier. But to your question, um, you, 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 we do gamification in different ways. What I mean by gamification is, you just did a game with me at the beginning of your show. So that's gamification. You're inserting a game-like scenario with a real life twist to it. And so whether you're on your Apple Watch, you're walking, you're running, uh, and you get rewarded for something, or you get points for something, that's gamification. And so the same thing, we have to do that in education, right? Esports has a competitive nature to it. I mean, everybody knows the definition of esports, it's a competitive game, right? But within that, you can kind of merge gamification to some of the courses, whether it be, be math, whether it be, you know, uh, robotics, coding, or, what, or whatnot. And then offer the competition structure at the end of end of the day. So, as far as practice, as far as team building, soft skills, hard skills, you can do that 
after school, just like football, basketball, anything else. And if you're a homeschool student, you still have opportunities, you still have platforms that, that are afforded to those individuals that don't go to a physical school. And that's the great thing about gaming, right guys? You can do it anywhere. Yeah. It's so much easier to play games anywhere too. Now that they have the Nintendo Switch and mm -hmm. cloud gaming, which has gotten a lot better over like the years since they've introduced it with Xbox to now. It's yeah. great. It has been. I mean, due to the infrastructure of our country, you know, we we're we're in a great spot. We we do have redlining. We do have deserts that don't have five G, but I think it, overall it's going to get better. You know, I saw, saw the White House do some initiatives as far as bringing five G and bringing fiber uh, internet to to everybody, and so. Hopefully in the next couple of years, it won't be as daunting for some people. But, you know, our major cities and our major hubs, you know, you're pretty much wired to go and, and, and play and get a good experience for everybody. Right. Yeah. How do you obtain industry partnerships to support the growth of esports and education? And what benefits do you bring to your students? Man, y'all got some good questions, man. So, it, great question. So, you know, before I get started with this answer, you will take 100 to 200, maybe 300 meetings. You only need a few yeses. Uh, and that's that's the trip I've been on for the last four years. You know, starting with the K-12 school all the way to Southern University Law Center, it, it, it's been those type of meetings. Uh, but you 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 have to know who you are. You have to know what your history is, what you stand for, what your mission is. And you have to present that in a way that a C-suite level executive can understand that. You can't go into a room not being confident. And I'll tell people all the time, it's the difference between being confident and cocky. You have to be confident and you gotta know exactly what your mission and goal is and go in a room and don't be afraid to ask the hard questions and don't be afraid to ask on behalf of the students that I serve every day. And so when we go and we have those new corporate partners, we bring in the numbers, we bring in the hard facts, we bring in who we are as an institution and it's up to that corporate sponsor to, to say, okay, whether or not we can work together. Now, sometimes it's low hanging fruit Sometimes it's, it's, it's a broader plan. Uh, plan. It could be a three to five year structure, uh, but you have to know how to structure those type of relationships uh, within the time frame you're given within those meetings and kind of build from there. Um, everybody's not gonna dive in head first and write you a big check and don't really know who you are. And so you have to start somewhere and build a relationship, guys. Um, and then work from there and know that you're in my situation in education, you know, the, I'm doing this for the students and not just for Christopher Turner or whoever I'm working. Okay, that's pretty good advice. But for people who lack confidence, what advice would you give them so they can pick up that skill? I truly believe, you know, you know, practice, perfect practice, you know, uh, building, building your networking skills, building you know, how comfortable you are to talk to people. You guys do a great job in talking to people all the time, knowing that relationships matter and how to build everlasting relationships, not just because you want to get, get a check written or you're, you have a certain goal set, but just to be a, a genuine person. Uh, those, those soft skills and that character is going to go a long way uh, before you build up your confidence. And so I think your confidence comes along with those soft skill sets. And, you know, trust me, guys, I know your mom has probably taught you, you know, you want to treat others the way you want to be treated. And so going going with that, that that's all that matters. Your confidence is eventually going to come. Trust me, I was, when I was your age, I didn't talk like this. I was a shy kid. You barely got anything out of my mouth. Now my mom is like, I can't shut Chris up. So it's going to come with time. Confidence comes with time. You're definitely correct, Chris. 
Everyone needs confidence. It's an important part in life. And even if you're shy currently, you can eventually become confident by practice. Practice makes perfect. What are, sure. some, oh, what are some of the most common misconceptions in esports and how do you address them in your work? So uh, I think I think one of the, the <laughs> it's how to spell a word. Let's start there. You know, if you're at the beginning of a sentence, it's a capital E, lowercase s, and you spell out the sports, right? Uh, if it's in the middle of a sentence, it's lowercase e, lowercase s, and I, you know, you spell out pr, p p r t s, right? I've saw, you know, the e with the hyphen, the lowercase e, the s, you know, just that proper verbiage on how to spell and use esports within the sentence or paragraph is very important. Um, you know, the 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 college uh, scholarship portion of it. They think a lot of people think that it's so new that colleges don't offer, but in fact, there's more than 700 college scholarships out here to grab. And you really don't have to be an esports athlete to get those scholarships. You can have other skill sets such as broadcasting, such as hosting, uh, shoutcasting, graphic design, production. You can you can work on the back end and gain uh, a collegiate scholarship within esports. And then, you know, I think the, the third thing is that African Americans don't participate in esports. And I think we participate at a high level. We just don't participate in your higher tier. We're more on your third tier, your fighting games, your 2K games, your Madden games. Those are the the the, the tiers that we play often and those titles that we play often. And so I think those are the top three for me. Well, that's good. Many people don't understand that the times are changing rapidly. And considering that so many schools are really old, the curriculums are probably out of date now. What would an optimal high school curriculum look like in your opinion for modern times, Christopher? That's another good question. I think, you know, as far as curriculum is concerned, we're, we're dealing with your, your age range right now, constantly. I think for you guys, you're more a hands-on generation. You consume, uh, you know, information at an all-time rate because of the internet, because of the technology that we have. And I think you're a generation that just doesn't want to sit at a desk. And so I think, you know, an esports curriculum can be partial sitting at a desk, partial soaking up information. But if you don't, if you don't gain those STEM career, you know, ready uh, skill sets as far as, you know, coding or seeing, you know, actually building a gaming PC or actually being immersed in uh, Unreal Engine or Unity where you're building a, a 3D world and you can actually touch Phil C. Uh, that, that's what a curriculum needs to be. Uh, it needs to be, you know, it needs to hit on all the senses for you guys. Because the way that, you know, I probably got taught and your mother got taught, you know, that's all we had at that particular time. Technology was real limited, but now it's not. And so you guys know that you live in it, you work in it every day. And so that curriculum has to match the time. Uh, and I think you're going to start to see that within the next probably two to three years the curriculum is probably going to change and kind of catch up where it's, be, where it's a fully immersed type of experience rather than just sitting at a desk, act, you know, reading and comprehension and doing Q&A like we've, we've been doing for like the last two or three decades. Right. In schools, them, in schools they only teach old things. Well, they do teach esports, but they teach a lot of old subjects and they don't teach, touch upon new subjects like you said, Unreal Engine and Unity and even MetaHumans, you can get jobs doing things, making uh, movies and MetaHumans or Unreal Engine. And you can do more than just sit at a desk and work on a computer all day. Well, considering you started your journey 10 years ago and people barely even knew what esports were 10 years ago, did you face any challenges in your work of 
promoting esports and education? Yeah, I think it, I think it was a lot of challenges. One, you know, one of my main challenges is has been getting my demographic, you know, which is African American, to see the value in esports. Uh, and I, you know, in traditional sports like ball and stick sports, right? You guys and you, you're probably going to relate to this. When you're when you're when you're a young African American boy, right? Or just a young boy, period. Let's take football for example. You can go, you can go to your to your family member and say, "Hey, I want to play football, right?" And it's a full pipeline for you guys. You can start with flag football at your local rec center. Then you move on, and you eventually put on a helmet, and you get to train early as a as a as a young boy, all the way up into middle school and high school. And then, you know, if you have the right skill set, Pop Warner, and then all the way up to collegiate, and then, you know, possibly the NFL, right? So it's a full pipeline for you to witness and participate in and have a goal set, and you can feel a part of it all the way through. We don't have that for esports yet. Uh, you, you have professional, you have collegiate that is really growing. Now you're starting to see high school and middle school kind of trickle down and start throw those leads and start those career pathways. And I think until the pipeline is fully built, uh, it, it won't. It, it's going to be a little difficult to explain to our demographic um, what esports is and the opportunities within that. And so that's that's been a real challenge for me, guys. But I think over time, it's just going to get easier. If that makes sense. That's great that are people out there like you are who are trying to encourage kids to get into esports. A lot of people are probably out there and really, really want to play these esports. And their parents might say no, or their teachers will encourage it. But now as we move into the future, more and more people will be able to have these opportunities. And it's great. It's awesome. Would you ever expand your esports team by playing more games in the league? Playing more games within the league that we're a part of? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I want to. You know, um, I think, like I told you guys earlier, exposure leads to expansion. So, you know, looking at, you know, other titles like Dota or League of Legends or Valorant, um, those titles that are not popular in our communities. It's all about going to those developers though and creating that relationship that I talked about earlier and being intentional in the conversation, uh, being confident in the conversation and letting them know that, like, hey, our kids didn't have accessibility to these these games. They're not real popular because we, we, we play console because it's more affordable. And then just building from there, I think it has to be an overall you know, diversity and, and inclusion play, uh, well, diversity, equity, and inclusion play with some titles. And so, you know, I think, you know, for 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 us, you know, playing a Valorant is going to be kind of difficult because we're used to playing with controllers. So we have to learn the keyboard first. We have to learn, learn the mice. We have to learn the characters on the game. And so, we have to partner with developers and, and do clinics and do, uh, you know, development courses to make sure that we have to, that we're giving your generation enough tools to catch up. Um, because we're definitely behind the curve in some games. We're way behind the curve in like a game like League of Legends, but that's the biggest esport in the world. That's the biggest scholarships, the biggest prize pool. And we just have to be exposed to that and given the tools and the partnerships in order to catch up. Uh, I think when that happens, uh, whether it be on my campus or other campuses, I think we're going to expand to other, other uh, titles. I think one of the low hanging fruit for, for me at the time, uh, when I think about my role at SULC and I, I think about my role at Southern, at the undergraduate, you know, I think Rocket League is one of those titles that we can push really easy. It has the trainable aspects within the game itself. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll be able to reach out to other colleges and scrimmage and, 
really gain our skills quickly. And I think it's one of the, the top tier esports that are like easily like you can go sit down at you know at a, at a uh, restaurant or a sports bar wherever you are and watch Rocket League and understand what's going on. Uh, other esports are not that easy to to watch. I love Rocket League. I think the game is great and people should watch it too. It's an amazing game. Do you enjoy Rocket League? I enjoy Rocket League. I don't get a chance to play Chase as much as I want to. Uh, but I, I definitely love Rocket League. I love Fortnite. And and, and 2K is probably my top three. What can game developers do to encourage education in gaming? I think getting, getting more out into the community uh, from that standpoint. Um, you know, vis visiting college campuses and going to high schools and and doing Q and A's of the the overall general community to understand what we want, what what our needs are, um, and then not not just getting that raw data and just saying, hey, we did something, but actually putting it to work and developing something uh, for us uh, to to move the needle forward. Uh, like I said before, being intentional is the key, guys. How do you ensure that your programs are accessible and inclusive for everyone, Mr. Turner? Well, I have I have a student whose name is Jeremiah. And every time I get a question like this, I think about Jeremiah. Jeremiah is in a wheelchair. And just from a physical standpoint, making sure that we have accessibility in our rooms, making sure we have wheelchair ramps, making sure that we have elevated desks. Uh, and then from the standpoint of our female gamers, I'm a girl that I have two girls. And so they keep me in check about certain things uh, when it comes down to the clubs and when it comes down to the programs that we're building to make sure that we have girl initiatives. Uh, even down to the undergraduate, we have uh, Liaja, Liaja is our community manager and she does a great job. She's not a real big gamer, guys, but she understands the opportunity that comes with gaming. And so just having her around is, is, is great. So no matter what color, you know, what color you are, what, what what's your preference, it doesn't matter. It should be a safe haven for everybody. And so we make sure that we do that and make sure that it's an open environment for everybody to enjoy and come come learn as well as, you know, have a good time. That's good. I see a lot more female esports players more in modern time than there used to be. Well, that's good that more esports programs are being accessible and inclusive for them and people who have other disabilities too. It's just nice to see. But before we move on to esports Maverick's news, I have a secret bonus question for you, Mr. Turner. Which console do you enjoy the most? Xbox, PlayStation, or PC? Gang sorry, guys. Party. Yeah, sorry, guys. So I, I got to be honest. Uh, so, so like right now I'm traveling, and so I have my game PC that we're we're doing an interview on. But if I'm at home, I'm a PlayStation Five guy. Good choice. I like PlayStation Five too. Xbox has its perks as well, but I think PlayStation Five has more exclusive games I'd enjoy. PlayStation definitely has a wide variety of games, and they have PlayStation Plus as well, which gives you a lot of games for free. Definitely that. You know, uh, I take advantage of PlayStation Plus year round. You know, I'm a 12 month su subscriber. And yeah, I if I'm not traveling, PlayStation is my preference. Well, great choice. I think we can add on another 500 points, Sage. Mm -hmm. Now it's time for Esports Metaverse News. Christopher, do you have any upcoming projects that you'd like to share with us? Sure. Uh, I have a a ribbon cutting on our a brand new esports and innovation lab through Southern Law. We're doing that March 10th 
Um, we also have an eSports Summit coming up March 16th and 17th. Uh, that's going to take place uh, in that new, new esports and innovation lab. Uh, I'm I'm hyped to have people like you know Dr. Chris Haskell from Boise State, uh, actually uh, Mike Aguilar. We call him Mook. He's he's the director at OU. Uh, you know the director from Full Sail uh, series. I mean, just a host of of esports friends and gaming and educational friends that I've made throughout the years, they're, they're actually gonna come to Baton Rouge and we're gonna have a great summit. Uh, you can go to sulc.edu forward slash esports to find out more information. And guys, I have so many other activations that I can't really speak on at the moment, but trust me, as soon as I can, I'll let you guys know and you can tell you know, your listeners and followers and viewers. Well, it seems like you're a really busy man, Mr. Turner, but I presume that you're pretty excited about the ribbon cutting and all these other secret projects that you have. Sure, I'm definitely excited. Um, and I, you know what? I'll give you an exclusive. It's, it's going to be some great stuff featuring Fortnite. So stay yeah. tuned. Ooh. Well, I can't wait to see what they're going to add. I have to watch out in the next couple of weeks. For sure. How do you see esports and education evolving in the next up in the upcoming years? And do you see them intertwine with each other more frequently? I think so. I think esports is going to be the catalyst of you know the next generation of not only game developers, but you know, that whole ecosystem as far as you know, STEM and even going over into like virtual reality and mixed reality. I think in the next five years, you're gonna see a lot more elementary, middle school, and high schools with esports programs. And, you know, the thing is, what kind of curriculum and what kind of uh, course courses can you align with having an esports team is going to be questioned. And I think the ecosystem is just going to provide so many opportunities and so many gateways uh, to, to, you know, what people are calling the metaverse or Web3. In, in the next couple of years, it's going to be amazing to see. We're definitely in a, in a fast growing time as far as technology. And I can't wait to see what you, you, you guys, Sage and Chase, what you're going to make this metaverse looks like, because uh, it's going to be your playground that I'm going to enjoy in the next couple of years. And I can't wait to see what you guys create and develop. Thank, Thank you. you. The metaverse is an interesting topic. We've asked a couple of people on our show this question before, but do you see the metaverse becoming mixing with esports like you're doing right now with education? Because as of now, the metaverse is really a casual place for people to hang out. But do you think there might be some sort of beat saber competition or boxing in the future? Yeah, I think I think it's probably beat saber. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I think that's that's like the low hanging fruit, right? I, I think about, you know, like Ready Player One being like fully immersed, you know, us putting on suits, being in VR and like exploring the world and, and having a meeting place. But not only that, if you talk about the esports route, you know, if the technology continues to grow at the rate that it's growing, I can see people playing, you know, football or actually becoming a player in in Overwatch or something like that and, and having a full immersive experience within those titles. And so you, you're talking about something that's next level at that point and the physical capabilities that you're gonna have to have to keep up is gonna be something to see too. I can't wait to see where, where the Maverick will go in the next couple of years. The PlayStation VR 2 just released and the games on there look pretty interesting. You plan on playing it eventually? Yes. I, I've I've ordered my VR headset. I'm waiting for it to come. Uh, I'm 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 excited because I have friends that are in industry and they write um, on new releases. And so I've read some of those write ups and some of those articles. And I'm excited to see what PlayStation takes the, the VR headset. We also have meta headsets within our room at, at SULC. So. Uh, whenever I get a chance, I'm going to be able to, to play a little bit 
and, and, and see what's out there. But I'm excited to see what's to come to. All right. And so a child who has skills in esports but might not want to be an esports player, what do you think they should do and use their skills? And how might they help their community or even society at large? Yeah, I think, you know, doing what I'm doing, um, just being an advocate for the opportunities and, and the career college pathways. Not only that, you know, you know, you, you don't want to be an esports athlete to your point, but maybe you can create the next you know, heads a special control or, or be a supporting cast member within a program or within the arc. Uh, that's something that we need to talk about, like the professional side of things. I think, you know, having the opportunity to, to design graphics or design clothing, you know, we talked about phase of somebody has to design all of that merch. Somebody has to come up with all of the graphics, all of the motion graphics, you know, even being a streamer, a uh, personality, and making sure that you're you're presenting yourself in a, in a great way. All of those opportunities and capabilities that we have at a at a you know a touch of a button now with with the power of computers and internet is amazing to me. I think you know it's gonna even go faster and grow faster than we ever saw before. It's just a matter of being motivated and just applying yourselves and doing your research and making sure you present yourself to the masses in a way where, you know, you can't be denied. So um, the opportunities are endless. It's the biggest ecosystem I've saw in my life. Um, now, mind you, I've only been here 38 years, but, you know, it's, it's one of the biggest ecosystems I saw as far as growth is concerned. And so I'm just excited to see like I said before, guys, what your generation is going to do with all of this. It's going to be something right. to see. Wonderful advice. But what advice would you give to someone who is interested in actually pursuing a career in esports, like playing the games? How might they do that? Yeah, I, I say you, you have a lot of leagues out here, a lot of platforms that offer coaching, um, making sure that you're approachable, uh, making sure that you know, your profiles and your social media uh, represents who you are as a, not only as a person, but as an esports athlete. So, you know, your, your, your banner and your presentation, your profile picture, you shouldn't have a profile picture of like the sky or your shoes. Like people need to see who you are. Uh, you know, you need to be reachable. You need to have all your links synced together as far as, you know, your highlights, you know, your videos, you know, everything needs to be on brand, if that makes sense to you guys. And so, you know, whether it be Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, whatever social media you're on, whether it's Instagram, make everything cohesive. Make everything speak to who you are and network. Don't be afraid, afraid to reach out to people, ask questions, you know, start those relationships that I mentioned earlier. And you're going you're gonna to start getting recruited. You're going to start seeing uh, certain things. But trust me, that's, like I said before, you know, you're probably looking at it, your top 20 to 30% of collegiate. But when you start talking about professional, you're talking about your top 2% in the world. And so that takes dedication and, and a lot of time on the game. And my thing is, you know, for somebody, you know, your guys' agents, you know, school comes first. You want you want to be a pro productive student first, and then a great esports athlete second. That's some good advice. I think it's time to wrap up the episode now. Now, this will be a last question about advice. But what final piece of general advice do you have for parents and children listening right now? Yeah, I say I say support parents. Do your research. Find out what esports is support your students, you know, to, to people that say, hey, I can't afford a high-speed gaming PC, do your research. You probably could build one at home. Uh, you know, save save for it. I mean, you know, cut back on the Chick-fil-A and buying some of those pairs of Jordans and invest in the high-speed PC, you know. Uh, but other than that, you know, you know, just do your research. I think a lot of, a lot of people don't really understand the market 
and really don't understand the industry. And there's so much information out here on the internet so you can kind of catch yourself up so you can understand what's going on. Um, I just don't want any parent or any student to miss this ship um, because we don't get ships like this often. And so do your research and, and just commit to something if you really want to be a part of this. It's one of those industries and communities that really appreciate people coming on board that are really interested in, in making this thing take off and where it's supposed to be. Thank you, Christopher Turner. Your advice is phenomenal and hopefully our fans will take it to heart. But before we go, how can people connect with you online? Sure, Twitter, it's go play ES. And that's go to Louisiana way, G-E-A-U-X, play ES. Uh, that's Twitter and then on LinkedIn, I'm Christopher Turner. Not hard well, to find at all. Thank you, Christopher Turner. And thank you guys for joining us on Esports Mavericks and Beyond. Bye.